how's it going? I'm Jacqueline Buchanan. I am super excited to bring you the next episode of Faces of California Fitness. Uh, I am part of the California Fitness Alliance and I work at InShape Health Clubs. I'm also a instructor at One Life Yoga and at Move Bar and Yoga. So today with me, I'm going to be talking with Leanne Orsi, um, who uh, owns Be Spun on Sunset Boulevard in Los Angeles. So how's it going, Leanne? I'm good, I'm good, how are you? Thanks so much for coming out to show our space. I'm really excited to talk to you today. The first question I would have for you is just to um, give me your story, tell me your background, how you got involved in this, and how you started Be Spun. Yeah, well, it's really a fun story. Um, I always had a background in entertainment, I grew up here in Southern California. I was a child actress. I grew up in LA and I was always an athlete. I was a gymnast, I was a diver. I did um, circus arts like in the summer and I was heavily involved in the fitness industry in the early 2000s. I was doing martial arts full time. In fact, I was a full time kickboxer at the time. I was competing amateur. Um, I never went pro or anything like that. But when a dance studio came up attached to the martial arts studio that I was affiliated with, I decided to put a studio in there. And what's funny is that I started a spin gym. So cycling, bikes, and I thought I could kind of carry off the business of the, of the martial arts studio. And I, for myself, had heard that pole dancing was a fitness activity that you could do, sexy dancing, feminine sensuality with acrobatic tricks. And I wanted to put some pole dancing in my studio and everybody told me no. Everyone was like, do not do that. That is a terrible idea. And uh, what's great is I was in therapy at the time and I told my therapist that I really wanted to do it and he said, do it. Don't you love like, therapy? Yeah. <laughs> like he was like, do it. Don't listen to them. If you want to do it, go for it. I put a couple poles in the back. I started learning on my own. It was such addicting activity. And that's what's so great for me as a business owner. You fall in love and it is totally, completely addicting because it engages your soul, your body, your mind. It's extremely physically challenging. It's emotionally developing. And what's great about it is that it is absolutely a sport where you come together with like-minded individuals and we've created a really amazing sisterhood all of my best friends most of them i found in these four walls i can go anywhere in the world and find like-minded people and we all came to this practice in a similar way and we have similar beliefs so it's been really really gratifying endeavor to be a part of i was one of the first people that started pole dancing as a sport in the united states um, it was preceded in the u.s by australia they started about two years before us i opened in 2006 i was one of the first 25 pole studios in the whole country i started putting videos on youtube and and I remember saying like, all right, like I'm kissing my acting career goodbye because I'm about to put a pole dancing video on the internet. And it was really very stigmatized at the time. This was 2007. I'm gonna go all in, I'm gonna commit to this. I'm gonna do it. And they became instantly viral and people started coming from all over the country to train and watch and whatever. And that's really when the business started to blossom. As a pole studio, you know, yeah. um, and then that whole journey that, you know, took a lot of courage to go and, and listen to yourself and to open it up. And I'd love to dive into a few of those misconceptions, if you wouldn't mind sharing. The stigma has melted away over the years. In the beginning, it was very difficult. I mean, you told someone that you were teaching pole dancing and they just couldn't separate it from a club environment. And like, no, this is an athletic practice. I mean, this is just another gymnastics apparatus. It's extremely physically challenging. It takes a lot of practice. It also takes like a lot of courage and it actually really hurts because you're hanging your skin from metal by friction. Like it takes a while for your body to overcome that feeling, right? right? And, and be like, I'm not gonna die. I think over the years we've gained respect that we ha as athletes that we haven't had before, but you know, there's still, even you look in the news today, like tension over women's bodies being displayed in sports. And one of the big misconceptions in pole dancing is that we wear these tiny bikinis or whatever to do it because we're trying to be overtly sexual. And in fact, we actually use our bare skin on the metal to stick. Fabric does not stick. Now there are people who've developed sticky clothing so that you can be more covered. But one of the things is that, you know, we're unclothed in some sort of rash showing of our skin, but really it's a function of the sport. It is actually one of the beauties of it because it forces you to shed your layers and really like confront yourself as you are and fall in love. There's such a beautiful with your body. 
acceptance mes message there, you know, yeah. acceptance of, of your body, of, of what you're capable of doing. A woman catches a glance of herself in the mirror and decides that she's beautiful. And she takes that feeling out of these walls and into her life. And it completely changes the way that she interacts with the world. And they really believe in themselves in a different way because of what they do in here. And that is what I love. Um, it's a transformative activity. And that's what's so funny that people want to make it, you know, disrespectful to yourself or to other people. Or one of the biggest misconceptions is that we do this for men. Like, oh, do you do it for your boyfriend? It's like, no, I do it for me. And this is a sport that's by women for women. And so people want to make it into something small. And it's actually really something big and really empowering. I'm not allowed to advertise on social media because I'm using the female form. Whereas, you know, surfers can advertise in bikinis, like surf companies can advertise their surfboards and whatever, but I can't advertise in this. And in the last five years, I've been in wars um, with the social media bigs over the inequities and the discrimination that we're facing as women athletes because we are being miscategorized sexual product. And it's not. It's a physical product. This sport is not only for women. We are actually the first pole studio to ever have a male instructor. We have amazing pole dancers of all genders here. Men specifically are so much stronger than us in the upper body that it's like way easier for them. And they have to really work towards grace and flexibility, whereas we really work towards strengths. Anyone who wants to come in these walls and climb is welcome. How do you find your instructors? Where do they come from? How do you source them? We are lucky here to have the greatest instructors in the world. That's one of the things that we're known for. We produce more professional pole dancers than anyone else in the world. I catch the talent here and, you know, usually approach them and say, are they interested in moving forward into our teaching? Right before the pandemic, I was developing a the first ever 200 hour teacher training for pole because this is a very challenging and difficult endeavor. And right. the idea and that technical. you- very And technical. And technical. And the idea that you could be qualified to teach anyone after one or two weekend seminars is offensive. There's so many subdivisions of what we do. Low flow, dance around the bottom of the pole, standing in the heels, doing choreography together. There's so many little subdivisions to go into and I think that they all need their own developmental course and that's something that I'm working towards. Something that you touched on before was a little bit about the inequity for advertising and some of those things. It just makes me think about the inequity that we have as a fitness industry in general and some of the work that you were doing um, as part of the LA Coalition down here to fight for fitness. I'd love to hear what your experience was like or if you have any key learnings from that. I am an athlete outside of this space which I do and I practice my own sport, but I go to other gyms and I participate in their fitness programs because it feeds me as a human being. It keeps me healthy and well. I think that fitness was really left behind in the relief in the pandemic. There were tons and tons of government support to many businesses and somehow fitness just flew under the radar. We were closed the longest and none of the proposed relief gave us help. Every fitness studio owner that I know had to take out a 30 year loan to survive the pandemic. And it is a tragedy. This was a pandemic that was about health and wellness and, and, and keeping our population well. And the thing we kept them away from is something that is the most important for people's well-being. My fitness deflated in the pandemic because I was alone in my own four walls with no equipment trying to move and, and being sad and being isolated from people. And I think that you know, these spaces are safe, they are healthy, you know, especially in mine, here we are seven feet distance and we are on our own equipment, which we sanitize regularly because we remove our skin oil from the apparatus so that we can like, stick to it. You guys were it. ahead of the curve in so terms we of use, <laughs> We use alcohol and social distance no matter what. So for us, it was unconscionable that we were not allowed to operate and give people a sense of community, a sense of purpose, especially in California where we were forced to close for a year. And we don't have kind of like the classic organizations. We need to band together and we need to become one large unit in order to affect change. And you saw restaurants had delivery. Restaurants right. were only right. closed there's for no, there's three no months. There's no takeout for pole dancing. There's no takeout right. for pole dancing. There's no takeout for fitness. And let me tell you, everyone became able to teach to their customers directly online with no overhead. And I had to maintain this overhead for a year 
with no relief. The PPP program did not help fitness studios because of the way that we employ. The rent is our biggest expense and there was very little relief for that. Finally, in the final hour, got together with the California Fitness Association. We started lobbying, we started talking to government leaders and not just like emailing people, but really coming together and, and taking action. You know, let's do a website, let's project manage these different things. Like we have to come together and move collectively towards change because we had no representation, no one fighting for our cause. We were completely left behind. There are um, bills projected now that are now possible that will give us the relief. So I really appreciated um, the other fitness owners who are going above and beyond their very challenging jobs of running a studio with not a huge revenue and having to become an amateur expert at everything to operate within this space and be successful. Now we're going above and beyond to work through political causes and I'm super grateful for Gina for taking the lead on that. And so here we are a few months down the line of really fighting for our ability to unify and make our communities well. Um, okay, we have a speed round of uh, okay. questions. Okay, so what's your favorite workout? I am currently obsessed with Legree. Legree? Do you know what Legree is? I haven't is? tried it yet, but it's I've, incredible. I've heard it's amazing. That's my side. That's my um, fitness side. Okay, what's now. your favorite music to work out to? Oh, I love me a good 80s mix of like 80s cardio. Favorite place to travel? My favorite city in the world is Tokyo. It exceeds every other city in the world. And my favorite country to go to is Italy. If you had a superpower, what would it be? Portaling, that I could just arrive somewhere, anywhere, in any moment and not have to deal with commercial airline industry. There you go. And then finally, if you could drive across the country with anyone. The person who would probably be in the car with me, whether it's on audio or in real life, is Tim Ferriss. I'm oh, a yeah. huge fan of his. His practices and teachings have really helped me overhaul my life in a difficult time. So I'm really grateful for him. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate our conversation and what you're doing, fighting for fitness and um, what you're doing for your your people here. I mean, it's such an empowering, wonderful, motivating space. And so thank you for the way you're showing up in the world. Thank you so much. And I'm ready to do more. So bring it on. <laughs> Great. Awesome. All right. Thank you for joining us. Tune in for more episodes soon.